May I begin by expressing appreciation to Lieutenant Governor for her heartfelt words, to John Fraser for his wisdom and, and wit, and my best wishes to his wife for a speedy recovery. John, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your very <coughs> moving words. I, I have to say that <coughs> it reflects both our work together and in common cause. When you were a parliamentarian and foreign minister, your pursuit of a principled foreign policy as part of the pursuit of justice and protection of democracy, and no less important, our abiding friendship which underpinned our engagement, as you put it, across the aisle, a friendship that will be enduring. So thank you, John. <laughs> May I say that I, I, I'm really very humbled and honored to receive the award from the Churchill Society for the Advancement of Parliamentary Democracy meeting as we do in remembrance of and in tribute to Winston Churchill, to a historical, inspirational role model for all ages. I recall, in fact, reference was made to Martin Gilbert, my late and very good friend, and I recall how he summed up Winston Churchill in words that I will never forget. He said, he is the embodiment of moral courage, a person who mobilized against evil at the same time as he protected democracy. I take this award also to be a recognition of the parliamentary and human rights cases and causes that I had the privilege to be involved with over the years. On behalf of political prisoners that I've represented who have inspired us all. In memory of my parents who taught me that the pursuit of justice is equal to all the other commandments combined. And in tribute to my wife, my children, two of whom are here this evening, and with my son-in-laws, and to my surprise, my granddaughter, Maya, who's with us this evening, who are individually and collectively implementing the legacy of the pursuit of justice handed down by my parents of blessed memory. And if I may, as well, a word to the <coughs> leadership of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, which I have the privilege to lead, who are also well represented here, what I call the next generation of human rights leaders who are protecting democracy for us all. Indeed, as I'm speaking to you, I can still recall a visit with my late father to Parliament. I was 11 years old. He took me, I remember, to Parliament where we went to the tomb with respect to the missing soldier. We went to the Supreme Court, and then he took me to the Parliament buildings. And he stood in front of the buildings in words that still resonate for me. And he said, son, looking up at the parliament, this is vox populi. This is the voice of the people. And he said it to me in Latin. Today, this might evoke a certain cynical response. But I can tell you that those words resonate to me with a depth of respect and commitment which, which they were uttered then and still inspire me now. And as it happens, we meet at an important historical inflection moment where we're witnessing a global political pandemic characterized by a resurgent global authoritarianism, the backsliding of democracies, assault on the rules-based order and the human rights which underpin it, and political prisoners as a looking glass into that pandemic, itself underpinned by a pandemic of impunity, which further incentivizes the human rights 
violations. I've written elsewhere six case studies, but for reasons of time, I will focus on three case studies this evening. One which has been mentioned, Putin's Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. Second, Khamenei's, or I should say Raisi's, President Raisi's uh, Iran and its massive repression as we meet of the peaceful protesters in Iran. And finally, Xi Jinping's China and his assault on what is, in effect, our common uh, humanity. And I'll speak to a political prisoner in each of these countries who serves as a looking glass not only into the assault on democracy, but how they are bravely defending and protecting it. May I begin with Putin's Russia, now in its ninth month of the unprovoked and premeditated invasion of Ukraine, where, as we meet, Russia is intensifying its crime of aggression, spoken of in Nuremberg and since as the mother of all crimes. With Russian missiles and munitions as we speak, targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure, targeting the necessities of life, hospitals, schools, water, electricity, plunging millions into darkness and deprivation in its ongoing war crimes and crimes against humanity. Indeed, our Rao Wallenberg Center documented these war crimes and crimes against humanity in its report, which also reference the standing breaches by Russia of the Genocide Convention, reflected as well in the direct and public incitement to genocide, ongoing as we speak, which is, as the Supreme Court of Canada itself held, a stand-alone violation of the, Geneva, of the Genocide Convention, whether or not acts of genocide follow, and which raise more than a reasonable risk of genocide, and which oblige us, under the Genocide Convention, to pre pre prevent and protect that convention is not just a convention on the punishment of genocide. It's a convention on the prevention of genocide. We're not to await until the genocide occurs. We are to intervene to protect when that risk already has occurred as it is as we meet. And so we need at this point to enhance our military, diplomatic, political, economic, and humanitarian assistance. And I'm pleased that recently the G20 Canada enhanced that assistance. And just yesterday, we, <coughs> NATO ministers further underpinned it. But I want to suggest to you very quickly a set of legal initiatives that must be taken and where Canada can take the lead in those initiatives. For reasons of time, I'm going to do them in one-liners. First. We need an independent tribunal for the crime of aggression. No existing legal or jurisdictional framework authorizes prosecution for the crime of aggression. We need to establish that tribunal. Ukraine has been at the forefront of calling for it. Number two, we need to support Ukraine's initiative before the International Court of Justice to hold Russia accountable for its false denazification incitement with respect to genocide. Number three, we need to hold Russia accountable, as I said, for its standing breaches of the Genocide Convention and where the International Criminal Court and other frameworks can provide it. Number four, we need to establish an International Claims Commission, the repurposing of assets, of Russian assets, for the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine, for which Russia has to be held accountable. And finally, we need to support the brave civil society human rights defender in Russia itself, where, as we meet, some 20,000 have been arbitrarily detained for nothing other than speaking up against Russia's war in the Ukraine, which, upon invading the Ukraine, Russia made it a criminal offense to even reference the war in Ukraine. And where Vladimir K. 
Karamurza, the brave Russian dissident, the effective leader today of the Russian opposition, is a looking glass into both Russia's external aggression, criminal aggression in Ukraine and its domestic repression at home. And there is a clear Canadian connection to Vladimir Karamurza's advocacy. He first came to Canada together with Boris Nemtsov, then the leading Democratic opposition leader in Russia, and Bill Browder, to support my private member's bill back in 2011, calling for Magnitsky sanctions. Fast forward to two, February 2015, Boris Nemtsov was assassinated outside the Kremlin. The Foreign Affairs Committee of Canada convened with regard to considering Magnitsky sanctions legislation. Vladimir Karamurza was the principal witness, testified, went back to Russia, was poisoned, and almost died. 2017, the committee convened again, became the forerunner for the actual adoption of that legislation. Vladimir Karamurza testified again, went back to Russia, was poisoned, and almost once again was assassinated. Having miraculously recovered, he then became a leading global architect for Magnitsky sanctions, testifying literally globally. I had the pleasure of accompanying him to testify in places, whether it be before the European Union, the United Kingdom, Australia, and the like. This Vladimir Karamurza, who was dividing his time between Russia and the U.S. because he transferred his family to Washington after the poisoning attempts, became a columnist for the Washington Post. When Putin invaded Ukraine, he went back to Russia because, as he said, he had to be with his people and stand with his people. And what happened is that he was arrested, arbitrarily detained in Russia, charged with, quote, disseminating false news, which was the false fake news law that Putin instituted when he invaded Ukraine, and more recently tried with high treason. And as we meet, is languishing in a Russian prison from which he incredibly still sends out inspiring reports, both with respect to the need to combat Russia's invasion of Ukraine and to protect democracy and human rights defenders in Russia. And I'm pleased that our Raoul Wallenberg Center is involved in his d defense. I happen to be appointed as a special envoy for the community of democracies on behalf of his case and cause, and I reference it for you this evening as a inspirational role model for the protection of democracy both domestically in Russia and internationally. Which brings me to the second case study, and I'll move more quickly, and that is Raisi's Iran. I'm speaking here of the president of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi, who first became publicly known in 1988 as a member of the death squad in Iran, which executed more than 5,000 dissidents. You would have thought that this would be grounds for his prosecution, except he was promoted to attorney general. And whereas attorney general, he initiated and presided over the largest per capita number of executions of any country in the world. And it didn't end there. From being the attorney general, he then became the chief justice of Iran, promoted to chief justice, where as chief justice, he presided over the massive suppression of the domestic protests in Iran in 2019, the forerunner of what is happening now, where thousands were killed in those protests alone. And then he presided over as chair of the Commission of Inquiry in Iran into the downing of flight seven, Ukrainian airline 752, where some 130 Iranian Canadians, re Iranian residents of Canada were killed, which a Canadian court has called an act of terrorism. And then he was promoted yet again, now to the presidency of Iran, whereas president of Iran, he is now presiding over the massive suppression going on in Iran as we meet. Talk about a culture of impunity. Here was the person who went from being the executioner in the death squads to becoming the president of Iran. While at the same time, as a looking glass 
into all this, both into this massive suppression, but also to the courage of the protests in Iran today, we have Nasreen Sutada, the iconic woman human rights lawyer in Iran, spoken of as the Mandela of Iran, who has gone down the line for women targeted in Iran's gender apartheid, down the line for juveniles destined for execution, down the line for journal journalists whose speech is silenced, down the line for the Baha'i, the religious minority, suffering persecution and prosecution, down the line for lawyers whose human rights defense has landed them in prison, down the line for other political prisoners until she, Nasreen Sutada, three and a half years ago, herself became a political prisoner. A woman in her late 70s sentenced to 38 years in prison and 148 lashes. A virtual death sentence for a woman of her age languishing in the prisons now of Iran. And where two days, two days after that sentence, Iran, it's hard to believe, Iran was elected to the UN Commission on Women's Rights. And finally, because of the brave people of Iran, finally there is this wake-up call. And on December 14th, we now have a resolution to remove Iran, finally, from the Women's Commission of Iran, and where we have adopted the first ever commission of inquiry re-Iran's criminality before the UN Council on Human Rights, which brings me to the third case study, and that is Xi Jinping's China, who is referred to what he calls the five sins, but where the five sins are effectively Xi Jinping's crimes against humanity. I'm referring to the mass atrocities targeting the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region of China, which are effectively and constituting acts of genocide. I'm referring to the assault not only on the democracy movement in Hong Kong, but on democracy itself in Hong Kong. I'm referring to the persecution and prosecution of the Falun Gong, a spiritual meditation movement, which 23 years ago, leaders of China undertook to have, quote unquote, in their words, eradicated. And I'm referring to the repression of Tibet and the menacing of Taiwan. And what is less known is that China, as we meet, imprisons more journalists than any other country in the world, as well as lawyers who would represent them, which brings me to the case study of Dr. Wang Bizang. Dr. Wang Bizang is a doctor in China who came to McGill University and received his PhD in medicine from McGill in 1982, another Canadian connection, if you will. He thought, yes, practicing medicine would be good, but it would be much more important to protect democracy in China. So he established the overseas China democracy movement based in the US. In 2002, traveling to Vietnam, he was abducted from Vietnam, brought back to China, charged in a sham trial of several hours of both the charges of terrorism and treason and sentenced to life imprisonment in solitary confinement, where he has suffered three debilitating strokes. And where his daughter, Tiana Wang, named after Tiananmen Square, a law graduate of McGill University, finally belatedly having gotten a visa to see her father in January 2019, upon arrival in Beijing, rather with her infant son, the grandson of Dr. Wang Bixan, rather than being allowed to see him, was cruelly put back on a plane and sent back to Canada. And so she did not see him. He did not see his grandson. And today he languishes in a Chinese prison. Just a word, if I may, and with this I close, one minute on each of three heroic political prisoners who have been putting their lives on the line for democracy in their respective countries, and I would say the case and cause of democracy internationally. The, f the first is Judge Maria Lourdes Afuni. She acquitted a political prisoner in Maduro's Venezuela, and for that, she was sentenced to 10 years imprisoned, where she was tortured brutally in detention. After she was released, she was 
charged in a new invented crime of spiritual corruption and sentenced to another five years in prison where she languishes as we meet in what has become known as the Afuni effect where Maduro sends a message to other judges and to the legal system, if you behave like her, you will end up like her in prison. She deserves our engagement for protecting democracy in Venezuela. The next in that regard is the Swedish Eritrean dual citizen, Dwight Isaac, who is imprisoned in the wake of 9-11, became known as Eritreans in 9-11, held incommunicado since then, virtually a forcibly disappeared person, denied any access to family, to council, to consular access, where he and his colleagues, as we meet, are the longest imprisoned journalists in the world. And finally, we have, with another Canadian connection, Saudi blogger Raif Badawi, where after he concluded his 10-year unjust imprisonment, with his wife and three children having fled and become refugees in Canada and now been Canadian citizen for years now, wanting to be reunited with his family, nonetheless is now still under, as we meet, a travel ban of 10 years, a speech ban of 10 years, a punitive fine of over $300,000, and here too, we need to stand up for those who are standing up for us and our democracies as they do so under such conditions in their respective repressive countries. And so it's our responsibility to speak on behalf of those who cannot be heard to bear witness on behalf of those who are not able to testify, to act on behalf of those who are putting not only their livelihood, but indeed their lives on the line. Five years ago, the Prague Declaration on Democratic Renewal proclaimed in a clarion call to action, and I quote, democracy everywhere is under threat, and those who care about it must come to its defense. Five years later, democracy is under greater threat. This is, if I may put it, a Churchillian moment. And it is our responsibility, as Churchill himself represented, to confront and mobilize against evil, to protect and defend our democracies. That is the best homage we can pay to the legacy of Winston Churchill and that is the greatest respect we can give to the case and cause of democracy, which has brought us all together this evening. Thank you.